All right, let me uh, let me start with a word of prayer. Lord, we come before you, our gracious God, our holy God. And we want to praise you for who you are, God. You are the uncreated creator, the one who is above and beyond all things. The one is completely separate, yet condescended to send your own son into this world to die on a cross, to die on a horrible cross that we might be reconciled to you mm. and grace. We thank you for your grace. You're so gracious, God. I mean, you could be a really stern, angry God, but you're so gracious. So perfect in every way. Mm. So we come right now. We thank you for your word that we're about to study. We thank you that you shared who you are, the very depth of your character in this word, mm. and your desires for us. So, God, we pray that we would benefit from it today through your spirit. That's it. Lighten us through your spirit. And then, Lord, we pray that you would take all the things that we hear that are necessary for us and apply it to our lives. We ask this all in the name of the gracious Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that prayer. Well, it looks like we've gained Doug, but we've lost Wendy. Yes, she is <laughs> at the Artisan's Fair because it's Gold Rush Days in Wickenburg. It's a big event of Wickenburg. The big event of the Wickenburg year, actually. Yeah. So, it's, yeah. The, yeah. it's the event of the Wickenburg year. Yeah. So well, it's great, great to have my great to have my two sisters on with us today. That's great. Hi. Good morning. Uh, Lauren, Lauren Connie. Well, let's let's begin. I just want to uh, pray too with with uh, join in Pastor uh, John's prayer that God bless our class together today. Lord, we thank you for your love. Thank you for shining the goodness of your everlasting grace upon our hearts and lives. We're thankful for this word that's everlasting and a living, transforming power for those who expose themselves to it. Lord, I'm so excited about this word that you loved us enough to have Paul write this stuff down and in in your sovereign gracious wisdom allowed this to transfer uh, from his heart to pay to papyrus to the new testament so that we millennia later can learn from the authority that you entrusted in paul to share with us the divine wisdom that only you have and the resources that we have to get through this travail of tears between glory to ultimate glory. And we're thankful for each one and bless each one and bless us today as we seek to rightly divide your most holy word of faith. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, let's uh, start with our first slide to get us orientated. Oh, uh, Chris, I'm not sure if you're aware, Dawn doesn't want to read today uh, just because she has an unpredictable cough. Oh, okay. Don't, we're, don't we're, okay, we won't charge her for not reading. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, Second Corinthians class five. And uh, let's go to, now we're going to do what we've done to get us into uh, what we're reading because it's what what where we left off is right in the middle of Paul's argument. So we're going to just have people read a verse leading up to the verse that we're going to start fresh. Okay, so this is all to get everything in short term memory. So Debbie, let's have you start with verse twelve and just read it. Debbie, switch it to Debbie. She just took a bite of something. So no. oh. that's okay. Oh, that's okay. Oh. That's, that's okay. Huh. I teach school. I'm used to being able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Corinthians 1 12. Indeed, this is our boast, the testimony of our conscience, 
we have behaved in the world with holiness and godly sincerity, not by fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and all the more toward you. Excellent reading, even though you had food, you did fine. <laughs> now, not notice we have a couple of things highlighted. We didn't have verse 12 highlighted in this way last time, but this time we do because words coming up are gonna be the same. I'm referring to the very first line there. Indeed, this is our boast. Now we're not gonna talk about boast uh, now, but we're gonna talk about it when it comes up in the, in the new verse, which he's linking back to verse 12. And let's remember too, that many, verse, many of the verses that are gonna follow are gonna link back to the second to the last line in verse 12 here. Uh, I'm not doing this, uh, all of this stuff on the basis of fleshly sarks, uh, fleshly wisdom, but I'm doing everything and I'm boasting in everything by the grace of God. Very, very important that we don't forget that. Okay, verse 13, and let's have, uh, if there's no questions about this verse, let's go to verse 13 and let's have Arlene read verse 13 for us. 2 Corinthians 1 through uh, chapter 1, verse 13. For we write you nothing other than what you can read and also understand. I hope you will understand until the end. All right. Very good. Thank you. Uh, any questions on that verse? He's See, his arguments are, uh, that we're going to see continue on in the verses that we cover new today. Uh, he will be speaking about what he says to them in that second part of his argument. Here in the first part of his argument about the, his integrity and his apostleship and ministry are legitimate uh, is from what he's written to them. Okay, so that's what this verse is bearing down on. Uh, any comments or questions? And if not, we're going to go to verse 14. I, I, have a, I have a quick question, please. Okay, sure. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Yep. Um, what was the literacy level like ah. back then? <laughs> Good question. Anybody want to, well, Pastor, Pastor knows, I'm sure. Uh, anybody want to take a guess? Other than Pastor? Yes. I mean, he can answer if no one else can, but let's let's have somebody give it a shot. I would say I would say in Corinth that there were a lot of literate people. You're right. There would be. It would be disproportional in Corinth. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where we're focusing. But let's start with generally and then we'll move to Corinth. In general. Well, I would say if he had to tell them that they're not giving them anything more than what they can read, uh, that their reading level might be low. I mean, what read has uh, some connotation uh, there. When you learn to read, you also have to comprehend. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, reading has more to do with just reading words. It has to do with comprehending what you're reading. Good point. And that, that was Paul's point there. Read, not just read and understand. Yeah, that's exactly what Paul was was but, saying he said you're not just getting these words you you know the the force and the and the uh the sense of them right uh so there was a that's implying a challenge i don't know what, um i don't know what the percentage is but it was very very low the uh you know literacy rate uh a lot of it was oral tradition so uh you know people learned orally way 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 better than we do i mean you know, the, uh, a lot of what we have comes from the oral tradition. I mean, what people heard, they were able to take in, remember. I mean, they have vastly better skills of remembering the stuff that was spoken to them than we do. We're visual people, so it's it's so much different for us these days. Yeah, on that note uh, about oral, if you look at carefully at all of the New Testament books, Every single one of them, they're written as though it's an oral presentation. Let's just take the book of Revelation. Remember how when we went through it, we saw how John was using oral mm -hmm. cues for them right. and memnonic uh, 
tactics to help them remember the structure. Remember chiasms, A, B prime, C, uh, A, B, C, B prime, A prime. You would use, uh, the gospels have huge amounts of chiasms in it. It's easy to remember something if you fo can follow the structure. Right. So the whole New Testament to one degree or another was written for, uh, uh, with the exception of maybe Philemon, for a corporate audience. And mm -hmm. because of that, they had to take into consideration that people couldn't read. Here's a, I'm going to give you the percentage, but before I give you the percentage, I think you're going to figure out what Pastor John just said is true about it was low. The average cost of a papyrus, let's take the Gospel of Mark, okay? 16 chapters. The average cost of that in Jesus' day was a whole year's salary mm -hmm. of one individual. Oh my God. The average individual individual huh. so that's why when you look at luke luke acts i mean the two longest books <laughs> in the new testament he's writing to theophilus well he mm -hmm. probably was the patron <laughs> for affording yeah. this thing mm -hmm. right um yeah. so given given how costly it was what does that tell us about uh how difficult it would be to read and we the other thing we got to bear in mind with that question is a great question because it helps us to see um, a lot of a, a lot of what Paul is saying more from from their oral. It, it helps us to see what he's saying more from an oral perspective, so we can key in on that a little bit more. Um, but um, the problem you had in the first century that we struggle with not relating to is they had no middle class. Mm -hmm. It was. The top, very, very top, and everybody was the working class. The closest we got to this was pre-industrial revolution in England, like in the 1700s, way up to and including the 1700s, when you had the gentry class and the aristocracy in England, and everyone was at the mercy of them. Um, That's more or less what you got in the Greco-Roman world in which Paul is is a part of here's the exception though corinth was a boom town mm -hmm. corinth is where 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 did priscilla and aquila go when they got kicked out of rome mm -hmm. by claudius the edict of claudius in 49 a.d where did they go did they go to pluto <laughs> i don't think so they went to they went to corinth mm -hmm. everyone that wanted to get ahead uh, if you were an innovator, enterprising, ambitious, anything, you went to you went to Corinth. Remember, it was the third most important uh, city, third most important in all of the Roman Empire, not because of uh, its intelligentsia. Uh, Alexandria held that, not because of its military power. That Rome held that. It's because of the financial uh, appeal. That it gave. You got the closest to a middle class in Corinth. And that was part of their problem, the church in Corinth, because money yeah. flowed very freely there. See, that's why Corinth studying first and second first and second Corinthians is so helpful for us. They are clearly the closest to uh contemporary our contemporary culture today. Okay, so great question, Brownie. Yeah. Um, Chris, can, can I just, can I ask, would it be a factor that um, the big people in the church would know how to read and the other people didn't so that they could really tell them what to do? Exactly. Well, <laughs> you're right. Okay, you just nailed it. What's going on in 1 Corinthians? Remember, they were coming together for the agape feast. See, in the, the early church, the first generation of Christians did not separate like we do somewhere along the line, we separated table fellowship and yeah. the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. They didn't do that. The early church ate a meal together and they honored the ordinance of the Lord's Supper together. Mm -hmm. And that's what they did at Corinth. Well, 
wasn't there all, anybody know what with the big problem that in his first letter he's addressing about that very thing about you have a bunch of people that are eating well and eating and then the the the, the and, have and, also, and also drinking well <laughs> right right and drinking well and then you have the have nots that not only don't get to eat anything but are put in the outer area of this lavish home and uh, we could get into the architecture of first century uh homes house church wow it's really interesting they're way way more uh opulent and, and ritzy and commodious and spacious than what you'd ever get, say, in uh, Palestine. And so all of the haves were hanging out together and more or less despising and kind of putting down the other Corinthian believers because they weren't of their status. Mm -hmm. That was going on big time in Corinth. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't sound like our culture at all, does it? No. <laughs> no. All right. Any other questions before we cleanse ourselves into a new verse? <laughs> okay, Brownie, let's have you take off on for this next verse. Second Corinthians 1 14. As you've already understood us in part, that on the day of the Lord Jesus, we are your boast, even as you are our boast. Okay, great reading, as always. So let's keep that up for a sec. Remember verse 12 was the boast. Uh, this is our boast. And he, and he lays out his testimony, which remember the word martis could mean my proof, my evidence that what I'm doing is legitimate, I'm authentic, et cetera, in my ministry to you, et cetera. So now he culminates it with, so look, he says, you guys, I've been with, I, my first visit with you was for a year and a half. And then I, I corresponded with you with that other letter, that painful one that we're going to get into in a few minutes. Um, you know all about me. I've sent uh, my emissaries to you. you. I was with you month on end, et cetera. And here he's bringing it all home about where all of this is leading to. It's leading to not just their, their, uh, life in Christ now, but to their ultimate salvation at the end. And that's what this last line is talking about. We are your boast in the day of the Lord, even as you are our boast. Now, let's take a second for that idea of boasting. We don't like it. I mean, at least on the surface in our culture today, we don't like the idea of boasting people that toot their own horn and all that kind of thing. The Corinthians, this was the problem that Paul was facing in 2 Corinthians. All of the, uh, the adversarial uh, remarks and behavior within the church and the reason for the tearful letter had to do with the fact, get this, that Paul wasn't boasting. Paul mm. wasn't boasting. See, in Corinth, remember, let, let's back it up so you can get the framework and get out of our culture and get into theirs. This, I think this will really help. They had what was called an agonistic culture, agonist uh, antagonism. It was based on honor and shame. How, do, how did that work? It works like this. Everything that you do is either acquired honor or lost honor. There's only two ways you get honor, prestige, status in that world at that time. There's two ways. One, you can't do anything about. It's a, it's a, it's a scribed honor. Gender, genealogy, and geography. What your sex is, where you were born, and whose who's you were. Okay, you couldn't do anything about that. That's why in a patriarchy, we see this all through the New Testament. In a patriarchy, women are second class. And that's why it's so remarkable, for example, in Acts, that Luke has Aquila, uh, Priscilla mentioned, after he mentions him first, when Paul goes to the synagogue there in uh, Corinth uh, and meets them, 
he he starts Luke starts with uh, Aquila and Priscilla, but from then on, he's he always addresses them as Priscilla and Aquila. Well, that's countercultural, not really, because remember when Paul, uh, when Priscilla and Aquila are helping Apollos later on mm -hmm. uh, in Ephesus, helping Aqu uh, Apollos complete his understanding of the gospel of Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. It's very telling there that Luke says Priscilla and Aquila took him aside and taught him. The women did. Uh, the woman did. And the husband did. So why is why is Luke giving her her do, uh, her dues in a in a patriarchal society? Why does Paul go patriarchal in different verses in different contexts, even in Corinth? Because that was the norm. The reason Luke didn't is because she was of of higher social status. Now, in all places in in the Greco-Roman world at that time. Corinth was the best place to be if you wanted uh, more status, even as a woman. You would have more status there because, uh, because money accomplished that, whatever. They, they were very competitive and all that stuff. And boasting was part of it. So where, where does this honor, shame st stuff come in? It comes in this way. You have the, you have the ascribed, the kind that you get. But this is the part where Corinth comes in. You have acquired honor. You can acquire more of it. Okay. And that's what you try to do in, especially in Corinth, because if you could acquire more honor, your status and your elevation, not just financially, but socially would go up. Well, how do you do that? Well, honor challenges. Now, if we go through the gospels, we see the Pharisees, the leader, Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the lawyers, what were they constantly doing to Jesus from Nazareth? Scumland. <laughs> they were challenging him. Testing him. Yeah. They were testing. They were social. They weren't doing this in private. They weren't pulling up Priscilla and Aquila, taking him aside and saying, look, you, you know, you're a pretty good guy. Why don't you get this right? They didn't do that. They always did it in public. Why? Here's, here's the payoff to understand their culture and why that was so important and why you needed to boast, why you needed to self-elevate. If, if we say you, we, we want to buy Teslas, I'm just using that as an example. There's no political statement here, or I don't have stock in Tesla right now. Okay. <laughs> My wife does, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but Say what? Say they do a run on them. What does Elon Musk do? Say, oh, that's that's too bad. You'll have to wait till next year when we decide to manufacture some more Teslas. No, they just make more Teslas, right? That's what we do. Well, in the first century, honor was something highly limited. It was a zero sum game. Mm -hmm. If you win an honor challenge, you gain honor and the other person loses it because there's only so much honor honor take a take a piece of pie at thanksgiving that you want to eat and there's only so much pie and there's so many interested eaters when you take a slice of of that pie off of that plate there's less pie that's exactly what's going on in an honor, honor challenge. That person loses that honor. Mm -hmm. And that is precisely why, getting back to Luke, that's precisely why Priscilla and Aquila took Apollo, Apollos, Apollo to the side. That would have been devastating for his ministry if they had done that publicly. Mm -hmm. Because they, he would have lost an honor challenge. And in our culture, yeah, okay, you can lose it. What, what happens in our culture? A week later, a month later, you're fine. It's like, you know, some guy just murdered something. In, in today's world, you can almost murder somebody. And three months what, later, well, he's not such a bad guy. Look what he did over here. <laughs> I mean, I'm exaggerating, but that's, what, that's why boasting was, was so important. Now, why is Paul doing it here? He's throwing it really back in their teeth. 
He's throwing it back at them because he's saying to them, your boast is in the work that I'm doing by the grace of God, and I'm boasting in you because of the work God is doing by the grace of God in you. He's, he's bringing it all back, not to themselves, but to the Lord. Mm -hmm. That's the clever way that Paul took that. Mm -hmm. And see, we're, we're not done with boasting because he's going to keep going on and on about how boasting in self yeah. is counter-Christian at core. Mm -hmm. We boast in the Lord. And in fact, he says that in, in other, other places in, in 1 Corinthians as well. Any comments or questions before we move on in America? Or on in Corinth? Okay, okay. In that case, let's have uh, Connie read the next verse 15 for us. Oh, is John, uh, Pastor John, do you want to say something? No, I'm good. Okay. Uh, I got to unmute. Um, I have to minimize these so I can read the slide. Oh, okay. it went away. All right. Yeah. The slide went away. Uh, you got it? No, I don't have the slide. Oh, here. Wait a minute. Let me try this. Second Corinthians. Got an ice cream cone on it. Blue screen. You don't have it? We're sharing it, so we should all be seeing it. Hold, hold on one second. It is this. It's too, I see it, but it's too small. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Is that it? No, I can't see it. Yeah, we had, we have something on our screen we can't get rid of, and it, it uh, covers oh. some words. It cut, yes. Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. We'll, we'll figure it out at some point. Okay. So. All right. That's fine. Let's have Dennis read it then. Den if Dennis can read it for us, that'd be great. Okay. Now, 2 Corinthians 115, since I was sure of this, I wanted to come to you first so that you might have a double favor. Okay, great. All right, we talked about the double favor a little bit last uh, last time. Uh, the double double favor uh, is an allusion to the, the two visits. I wanted to come to you first so that you might have a double favor. Uh, we'll get into that part of it in the verses that follow to make more sense of it. But for now, I want to focus have us focus on the highlighted and all capped word that wasn't last week because i think we're ready for it since i was sure of this hmm uh who's gonna read the question uh for this verse that deals with that one word let's have betty read this question slide once it comes up Paul's rock solid assurance of this refers back to question, question, question mark. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> okay. So if we can go back to verse 15 so they can uh, relook at that verse 15 that Dennis read for us. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, as someone who teaches kids to write a little bit, I would assume it's a reference to what just preceded it. And that uh -huh. was assurance that, um, that the boast was in them. Um, and likewise, since I'm sure of this, I would assume that it didn't go deeper into that, but maybe it did. But that's that the, would be part of it. But it goes, you're right, it, it refers backwards to the previous verses, obviously. Um, and that would be part of it. But it goes all the way back to the foundation for all of it. Mm -hmm. It was in verse 12. It was the, oh. the basis on which Paul uh, had a good conscience, the basis on which uh, their behavior the their behavior in the world that you mean their godliness and the that not, not their no not their godliness um in fact they were accusing the mi minority of the people within Corinth of the Christians there were accusing Paul 
of oh, being, having fleshly, wor worldly, human standard type of wisdom. We're talking about the grace of God. There it is. Of That's it. It. <laughs> okay. it all goes back. The, his assurance always goes back to God <laughs> in one way or another. Okay. Yeah. His ministry goes back to the grace of God. His uh -huh. service to the community, their, their uh, life in uh, life as Christians goes back to God. He's always bringing it back to the center. And that's why this verse 15, this assurance I have, what assurance? The grace of God through my ministry that flows from me to you and you back to me is uh, his unmerited favor, his unmerited love and, and gift towards us. Okay. Doesn't it, doesn't it uh, also touch back to, well, verse 12, like you said, about his boast, our conscience testifies that we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially in our relations relations with you in the holiness and sincerity again and here it is that are from god you know so he, that's his boast that's the reason i i thought he's referring back to that confidence he has in their con his conscience that testifies how he has conducted himself in the world and in relationship with them yeah which which where is that where is that from uh, god yeah where, yeah the source he, right yeah. he he can boast but it's not really him boasting He's yeah. boasting about what God is do doing right. through him. Exactly. Yeah. And, and what's so cool about it is how he's going to turn, continually turn, try to turn them back to the true nature of the Christian life, that it's not power above transcending weakness. It's power in it. Mm. It's we gain our power. What kind of power? Well, not the kind of power that the average Corinthian was after. Mm. The real power is divine. Mm -hmm. It's unlimited. And the only way that we get there is through flips is suffering, travail, mm -hmm. testing, trial, and uh, weakness. Mm -hmm. he, weakness is more or less a, an equivalent for Paul functionally for Thlipsis. Because Jesus had to learn. Read Hebrews two or three times. There's verses there that are saying in, in his own way what Paul is saying here in 2 Corinthians. It was through the suffering that he was completed. It was through these he learned obedience. It was through these things that God's power emanated through uh, to others through him. Uh, okay, so good. That's great. Let's go to any questions before we move to the next verse. Because it's going to all keep building. Uh, Doug, if you could read uh, verse 16 for us when it, once it comes up. Yeah. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 1 16. I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia and have you send me on to Judea. Okay, thank you. Great, great reading. Let's keep that up. Notice the red arrows there. Okay, I wanted you to, to visit you on my way to Macedonia, way at the top, the, the uh, northernmost red arrow, uh, when he was going to Philippi and, and uh, Thessalonica and all those kinds of places. He, he wanted to visit them on his way there because they would be in route from from east towards to west and then come back around from there uh on his ultimate journey back to jerusalem on his way back to Ju judea so notice how they're they're literally a a shipping um port that would be very easy for him to jump off of a sh ship in the harbor of uh maybe um Let's see, where would that be? I, I can't remember the name of one of the big harbors there, but it, there in Macedonia and then uh, the harbor there for uh, to, to Corinth would be easy. And then from there, uh, go further east uh, to Jerusalem. So he was he's reminding them here about what his plan was. And they know about it. That was that double favor stuff. And mm -hmm. let's unpack it as the verses that follow. So if you have questions about um, how this works out, um, hold them for the, the rest of the verses because the, the, the verses that follow are going to help us understand better what he's saying here in 16, okay? 
So let's go to seven, uh, verse 17. Let's have Pastor John read it for us. Okay, 2 Corinthians 1, 17. Was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Do I make my plans according to ordinary human standards? Ready to say yes, yes, and no, no at the same time? Excellent reading. Let's keep that up for a second. Okay, obviously, this is a rhetorical question. He does not expect anyone there when they hear it uh, to think that he's asking this question to gain information. Rhetorical questions like, when we were little kids, we, we understood a rhetorical question at the age of three or four. Do you want a spanking? <laughs> Remember that one? Oh, yes, please. <laughs> A four-year-old knows the best answer is no answer. No answer at all, yeah. <laughs> okay, so Paul, that first of all, this question really isn't a question. It's dramatic. When you use a rhetorical question, you're, you're trying to emphasize something. So what is he trying to emphasize? He's telling the Corinthian converts, he said, come on, come on, man. You know that I'm not wishy-washy. I, I don't speak out of both sides of my mouth. And so he goes on and says, a follow-up, he gives a follow-up rhetorical question. Do I make my plans according to ordinary human standards? Now, that is what we have highlighted, ordinary human standards. Well, guess what? That word there <laughs> is the same word that we had earlier back in verse 12, when they were thinking that what he was doing was based on uh, fleshly wisdom, or what they were doing was based on fleshly wisdom, sarks, the Greek word for flesh. Mm -hmm. And Paul's using it here. He's saying, literally, do I make my plans according to the flesh? According mm -hmm. to the flesh. Now, that's a unique, we'll bring this slide back up in a second. That's important to understand Paul's terminology and what he means by it, because only he uses this in the New Testament. There's one exception, a loose parallel in John's gospel, but it's kind of loose, and it isn't loaded with the freight that he gives to the word sarks. 20 times he uses this phrase, this word sarks, according to the flesh. And last week, we talked about what the flesh meant. meant. Uh, just read Romans heavy in Romans, heavy in 1st, 2nd Corinthians, a, a little bit in Galatians, one, one or two in Ephesians, and one, I think, in Colossians. It's all over, Paul. And he's yeah, talking I can, pull out one, I can pull out one verse out of Romans right now that really nails it. Really brings okay, it go ahead. Uh, this is Romans 8. He says, those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. You know, and then he goes on and on about the, you know, worldly nature, the world, you know, the flesh. He's not controlled right. by the flesh. We're not controlled by the flesh. Right. Now, what what's kind of confusing, what could be confusing? Great verse, Pastor. Thank you. Uh, what can be confusing about Sarks? is he accuses the Corinthians a couple of times of maybe being fleshly, maybe being mm -hmm. unchristian, because, see, they're, he's taking on them accusing him of mm -hmm. being, remember, this is a rhetorical question right back at them. Mm -hmm. So he's saying to them, uh, come on, you really think that I live and, and act and decide according to the flesh? In other words, devoid, like that verse that Pastor uh, just read from Romans 8, devoid of the Spirit, because uh, many instances, Paul will use flesh for a the antonym to the Spirit, life in the Spirit, like, mm -hmm. like that one in Romans 8. And that's not the only one where he uses it that way. However, unfortunately, Christians... Remember the word that he uses earlier in Romans for the non-believer, the unregenerate, the old man. Remember that phrase, the old man? Yeah. Okay. Or another one would be the first Adam. 
the first atom did this, the second atom did that. Mm -hmm. Well, we're not aligned. We're not in solidarity with the old man anymore. We're in solidarity if we have been regenerated with the new man. Same with the first man. We don't identify, identify with, we are in the old man. I mean, we are in the first atom, but we don't identify with it. Why? Because mm -hmm. we have a new identity. It's the, it's the second atom. That's our new identity. Why? How can we possibly say that? We are a new creation. That's why we can say that, right? Yeah. Now, how can we be so sure? Let's think about that. I want to share with you something that was, was like a mini epiphany for me the other day when I was studying Acts 19. And I'm going to give you a verse, and you guys, you're going to say, "So what? Who cares?" Until you, until we ponder the potency of it that Paul shared. Okay, you're going to know the scene. I'll give it to you. Paul goes to Ephesus. Remember, he had a really quick stop, just for like a couple of weeks, and then he went. He went. Uh, to Jerusalem, then Antioch, and then he comes back around to, to Ephesus. And when he gets there, he finds some disciples. That's all the way that Luke describes these disciples. He comes to Ephesus, he gets there, and he comes across some disciples. Lo and behold, they had been disciples of John. Mm -hmm. So here is the question that Paul puts to them. Have you received mm -hmm the Holy Spirit, when you believed. Now, you might say, so what? Who cares? Okay, guess what? He could have said, did you read 15 tomes of this great theologian before you believed? Did you pay X number of silver coins uh, to get what you got? No. He said to them, have you accepted the life of the age to come mm -hmm. when you believed? Have you enjoyed a transformed experience from darkness to light when you believed? That's what he's saying. He's assuming that the test for the old man and the new man, the first Adam, the second Adam, in the flesh and in the spirit, is having the spirit. Mm -hmm. of the new age yeah. now we take that for granted but mm -hmm. paul didn't paul used that as his test the acid test of whether you're in the kingdom or outside of the kingdom and so see the irony here of the corinthians that he came under the unction and the power of the spirit and brought the transforming gospel and the holy spirit to they're accusing him of being in the flesh. Yeah. He, and he's saying, are you kidding me? I'm not, no, no, yes, yes. Oh, absolutely, I'm going to come. Oh, uh, well, wait a minute. No way, I'm not going to come. He's saying, no, I'm not devoid of the spirit. Not at all. Why? Because the hallmark of my life and my identity is the spirit of the living God who transformed me. And I came and shared with you that same transforming message. Pastor John, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I was just thinking, interestingly enough, um, I remember Gordon Fee making this very same point about Galatians, where he says, you know, that's the test that uh, that Paul gives back to the Galatians. He says, are you so foolish after beginning with the Spirit, you know, trying to attain your goal by human effort? Have you suffered so much for nothing? Uh, does God give you this, his Spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law? Or because of what you have heard, you know, he's and he was making that point that he doesn't say, "Have you, uh, have you, have have you gone and and said the sinner's prayer, you know, to become a Christian?" And that was Fee's whole point. No, it's not the sinner's prayer that he's going for. He's going the spirit. Have you received the spirit? Because if the spirit is the acid test, like you said, you know, and he does, Paul does that with the Galatians. You know, have, yeah, right. has everything that you've done been by your works or? Yeah. But crying out loud is it by the spirit of God. Right, um, right. Great point. Wow, I love it. Let's go back and reread verse 17 and, and try and uh, recapture the thrust of what Paul is getting at here in verse 17. So let's have Pastor John read that again for us. Okay. 
uh, was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Do I make my plans according to human, ordinary human standards, ready to say yes, yes, and no, no at the same time? At the same time. Yes, great. Okay, great reading. So the thrust of it isn't this double-powered rhetorical question to put them in their place and say, come on, you know I'm a man of integrity. You know how I was. I mean, he wasn't a fly-by-night that came and left, came and left. Everything he did, he did for them. Remember, he never worked. He he didn't want that. He didn't want them. He didn't want to have to be behold. He's they're one of the few, if the only churches, that he wouldn't take um, funding from because he knew that it could be a problem that they use that as leverage uh, with him and he wouldn't do it. So he would work uh, to, to, with his uh, labor and in every way they knew that he was a man of great integrity and he's bringing that to their attention that this all happened because of the grace of God. I, it's not that I'm anything great, it's because the power of God uh, allowed these things to happen to me. Now, let's give, let's take that uh, for a second, how important integrity is as the, uh, the power of it. The power of integrity, the power of a, tra a transparent life where we walk the talk. I read where John Stott wrote down his amazement of something that happened uh, he has John Stott. I think most of us know this guy. He mm -hmm. uh, was a tremendous. Um, he's written a lot. He's preached a lot. He had All Souls Church in London for many, many years and had a great ministry. And Jill, B Billy Graham came to London years ago when John Stott was at his peak there in, in his own ministry. And he came and he preached night after night in Wembley Stadium. Now, if you know Wembley Stadium, it's colossal in size. And it packed out night after night. And John starts puzzling over, how can that be? Most of these churches, in fact, if not all of them, are only half full on Sundays. How is this guy getting all of these people to come and hear the gospel? And then it came to him the reason why they were they came here was a man with the power of integrity the power of a, a sincere message with the open books unlike many of these televangelists out there they do not open their books to the public of where they how much they get and where it all goes billy Graham did that and his ministry like Paul's of integrity, of complete integrity, drew people to that stadium. At least John Stott thought that, and I'm sure that was part of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, questions, comments? Let's go to verse 18. I would uh, just say that even though there seems to be a rebuke here, that mm -hmm. he mm -hmm. uses this as yet another opportunity to bring them back to the faith. It, yeah. So that his heart intent is always to bring them back to the faith. That's right. Good point. Yeah, let's not forget that. That's a great point. Okay, uh, Betty, it's your turn. Verse 18, if you would unmute as you can do. Second Corinthians 1 18. God is faithful. As surely as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. Mm -hmm. Great reading, Betty. Thank you. Right. Let's keep that up. Verse 18. Now, notice that Paul is now in this verse strategically beginning to turn the focus from his own faithfulness to God's faithfulness. I mean, God's faithfulness has been in the background all along, but he's been telling them, look, come on, you know how faithful and, and sincere and, and open and honest I've been with you guys. Here, he's directing it back to the source of his own sincerity, his own integrity. As surely as God is faithful, and notice how he plays with that here. Our logos, 
our word to you is not yes and no. And why is that a play on words? Well, when he says our word, um, you could catch up with it the first line, God's word. Well, logos means, I mean, we preach the word, mm -hmm. right? Our word, our, our, our gospel. So he's, there's all kinds of little layers here of ways that you can understand. And again, see how the oral, when you hear it orally, our logos, hmm, it, it would get them thinking about, oh, wow, yeah, God's faithful, Paul's faithful, etc. So it was a clever way of putting that uh, for them. Let's go to verse 19, unless people have questions, comments, or insults. Okay, if not, verse 19, let's have Debbie read it. All righty. 2 Corinthians 1, 19. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Sylvanus and Timothy and I was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. Amen. Okay, so the focus here is on God's Son, who they proclaimed, and he's he's bringing his uh, co-workers in for the first time, explicitly anyway. I mean, he had Timothy there at the very beginning. And Silvanus is just another word for Silas. Paul, uh, he was with Paul in his second missionary journey, and he uh, came and met uh, Silas and Timothy, met Paul at Corinth when he first arrived there after Paul left Athens for Corinth. So that's when they first uh, were together in their ministry to Corinth. And many times uh, Paul would send Timothy um, as a proxy for him when he couldn't be there. So these guys were really committed to the Corinthians as well. And he's saying all of us, uh, we weren't yet vacillating. We didn't speak out of two sides of our, our mouth. Why? Because in him, see how he's linking their ministry, their word, their service, their life, and the words that they speak to Christ. It all comes from their commitment and their solidarity with the, with him. And he's trying to enjoin them to do exactly the same. All right, verse 20. Any questions? Any questions? If there are, we can uh, catch them on, on verse 20, which continues to build his argument here. Let's have Arlene read verse 20 for us. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1.20, for in him, every one of God's promises is a yes. For this reason, it is through him that we say the amen to the glory of God. Excellent. Excellent reading there. Now let's not let's not bypass too quickly the very first word, that conjunction that Paul uses here in verse 20. Uh, everything that he's been saying leading up till now, why the, the, the three of them uh, were doing things the right way and not absolutely we're coming and uh, no way we're not coming and all that kind of stuff is because because in him, all of the promises that we make to you, whether we have to change plans because the Lord has changed our plans or not, they go back to God's promises and they're always a yes. So we hear he's going with the no, no, yes, yes. And now he's moving it on the firm, unshakable ground of God's promises that go directly back to scripture. God's promises are always yes, and it's for this reason, through him, through Christ, for in Christ, see, know, know how it gets delegated from God to Christ, through the Spirit, to Paul, Silvanus, and mm -hmm. Timothy, and for this reason, it's through him that we say not just amen to the glory of God, Thankfully, I looked up most of the translations, thankfully, they keep the article in front of amen there. For this reason, through him, we say the amen to the glory of God. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why do we need, or, or do we need the the? First of all, let's back up. Let's do, do basic things first. What does that mean, amen? So be it. So be it. Okay. Yes. Anything else? Yes. It's an affirmation word like. Yeah, true. True that. 
<laughs> true dad. True dad. Yeah. True dad. I like that. A true dad. True dad. <laughs> okay. Well, this shouldn't be too, this is kind of a leading question, so it shouldn't be that difficult to know the answer to it. Remember when we read the book of Revelation back in uh, the 19th century together? <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. What? Yeah, after writing that very long, very powerful apocalypse, what is the last word in the book of Revelation? Oh, man, I wonder. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. May, may it be so. Yeah. Remember, yeah. he ends it there by saying, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all God's people. Mm -hmm. That's how he ends it. Be so. Amen. May it be so. So be it. It's like a, it's really a prayer to the Lord is what it is. So this, the reason he's got the, the amen is because it all comes down to God doing all of this stuff. God has faithful to his promises, all of them, plural promises in the past. Now he's referring, isn't he? To the scriptures that Paul shared with them about the promise of salvation through the prophets of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. He's see, Paul will, is never never renounces the old covenant. Mm -hmm. He never renounces it. He just says it now has been transcended by the new covenant, but we it's still scripture, it's still inspired, we can still learn for, from it, but as we're going to see in the chapters that follow that are really rich in helping us uh, figure out the continuity and the discontinuity between the Testaments. I like how one, one person put it about why we have to keep uh, that tension there. We have to keep the tension there because without the Old Testament, we wouldn't know about the fulfillment of all of this stuff that comes to fruition in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if we didn't have the New Testament, it's kind of like reading a mystery novel. You read it, and if you rip out the last chapter, you have no idea how it ends. That's what we have without the New Covenant. That's what we have without the New Testament. So what he's doing was sharing with them about the great stuff that's come down in God's promises that are now fulfilled in the new covenant, they're all based on all the great faithfulness and steadfastness that God has shown himself um, in time and time again in all the promises that God made to his people in the Old Testament. Mm. Okay, so that's the, that's the thrust and that's Paul's argument, which is irre irrefutable, obviously. Mm. Yeah. Okay, uh, comments, questions? If not, it's brownie time. Verse 21. 2 Corinthians 1, 21. But it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us. Excellent. Okay, so he's building on what he's just said about God's promises. They're all yeses to God's people. And that word there for establishes literally can be translated because it, could, it was used in courts in the day, and they would have used it not as establish, but authenticate. I'm going to give you authentic, authentic, uh, an authentic witness or authenticating documents, evidence uh, for our case today in, in this courtroom. So, mm -hmm. but it is God who authenticates us with you mm -hmm. in Christ and has anointed us. Now, this verse and the verse that follows is going to be Paul's way of sharing with the Corinthians their conversion in Christ, their calling, and their consummation. And he's playing with the words there when he says, all of this is authenticated by God in Christ, Christos, and has anointed us, and has Christed, Christed us, anointed. Mm -hmm. Meaning, remember when Jesus was anointed 
uh, Jesus had his own anointing in his own ministry. Remember in Luke 4, uh, mm. when he's in the synagogue in, in, in Nazareth, God has, has poured his spirit upon me, and he has anointed me in the debut of my ministry to preach the good news mm -hmm. that was promised from long ago. That anointing that was upon him without measure, we now have. Mm -hmm. And so let's go to verse two, no, 20, I'm sorry, 22, and, and we'll go back and forth between these two verses because there's a lot of powerful and rich stuff here that we need to mine. Uh, we'll take the questions on 21 after we look at 22. So Dennis, if you could read 22 for us. Second Corinthians 1, 22, by putting his seal on us and giving us his spirit in our hearts as a first installment. Okay, excellent. So he has anointed, he has Christ, uh, Christed us, so to speak, by putting his seal on us, giving us his spirit in our hearts as a first installment. Okay, so what we've got here is an incredible analogy of a spiritual reality, right? Notice the word here that he uses in that first line, by putting, by placing his seal on us. Anybody have an idea how the word, how the a seal was used and what it represented back there in the first century Greco-Roman world that the, the people in Corinth would have understood it? Well, Didn't we see that in Revelation? I mean, yeah. the, I mean that was so critical and important. And that yeah, and we did. No. Yeah. So what did it? What did the seal? What did the seal mean? Gordon's going to share the something. The seal identifies those who are set apart for special pro pro protection in the midst of judgments from God. Is what I had. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That's great. A seal could mean protection, and we have that both uh, parallels in the Greco-Roman world, and we have it in the Old Testament, where this, a seal would be protection. Uh, believe it or not, you have it in Psalm of Solomon and some of the Psalms. Yes, a seal could mean protection, safety, guardianship. Excellent, Gordon. Mm -hmm. It had another. What about when you send something, well, the, a very the, important document. And the movies sealed. that you see, you see them putting seals on the back of scrolls and parchment when it's going from one, you know, sender to a, a recipient so that it's not, it's only to be opened by the person who is eyes it's supposed to go on. It shows that it's like, you know, still together. They would right. put their, you know, put it in that, you know, whatever. And it could show authenticity then too. There you go. Yeah. It go right twofold. It does show authenticity. Remember the uh, verse before it says, "The one who establishes us, the one who authenticates us." Now, what? Take a guess. What tense verse twenty one is in? That verb, authenticates, establishes us in Pre Christ. Present tense. Present progressive. It doesn't end. The mm -hmm. act, the okay. divine act of authenticating us is ongoing. And because of that, we are sealed. And that sealing isn't just authentication, as, as powerful as that is. And it's also protection. But it also is about ownership. The only one that can have, should legitimately get that document is the owner of that document with that seal on it. And that's what would, would ring very powerfully in the ears of the Corinthians to hear that they are owned. How are they owned? We are owned by God. He has sealed us for himself. Mm -hmm. We are marked. We're stamped. Remember in Revelation how he puts it? He will give us a new name. Mm -hmm. He will give his people a new name. Why? Because they are his. And remember, we learned in 1 Corinthians how he said, you are not your own. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you have been bought with a price. 
So this seal is a very powerful metaphor for who, or rather, and much better than Corinthian mentality of who I am myself, no, mm -hmm. whose I am. Mm -hmm. I am a child of my heavenly father who has placed his spirit. And now we, got, we get to that verse 22 part at the end there of the down payment or the deposit. Remember the Greek word, I think you've heard it, arabon or arabon, down payment. Sometimes English translates it deposit, first installment, etc. Do you know that before, let me share you a story to show you how all of this comes out of the world in which Paul lived. A hundred years ago, when they were studying verses like this that had Arabon in it, down payment, deposit, seal, what, uh, all of that kind of language, people were saying this is Holy Ghost language because Christianity didn't have the words for that kind of stuff. And then a German scholar by the name of Adolf Deisman came along and he went and did, he, he was a New Testament scholar, uh, very, very knowledgeable, very great in his own right. It's a, wrote a lot of bunch of stuff uh, many, uh, many decades ago, but he was also an archeologist. And at the turn of the 20th century, around the 20s, 1920s, he went to I Egypt and they were doing all kinds of digging in the Nile, around the Nile. And they found a treasure trove of papyrus, thousands of papyrus of intel the intelligentsia and all the high-minded power elites of the day. No, it was the commerce, the papyrus of everyday transactions. And the word Arabon kept being used over and over and over again in first century Greco-Roman world, meaning deposit, down payment, guarantee. Paul used the term everyone knew and took it out of the secular world and put it in the spiritual world mm -hmm. and shared with them, you know what? You have a foretaste now of what's to come. You don't have to wait for it. You've already got it because Arabon means a first fruit. It's another metaphor for first fruit. When, when they went to the harvest, uh, the early stage of the harvest, the first fruit would be given a sacrifice to the Lord in the Old Testament, right? Mm -hmm. It was evidence of the harvest. It was part of the harvest. It wasn't fictitious. It wasn't mythical. It was a part of the harvest. Our reception of the Spirit at regeneration links us permanently to God and the kingdom to come. Mm. That's why it's authenticating constantly. And that's why Paul later is going to say, we go from one degree of doxa, glory, to another, from being renewed to the ultimate renewal, where we will be just like Jesus, because we'll be seeing him as he is, and he's going to make us like he is. So mm. no longer will we sin, and no longer will we will we be able to sin when mm. we get there. Mm. But along the way, we've got this great down payment mm. guaranteeing us, guaranteeing us of what's yet to come. So mm. here's a question. Here's a question that let's ask uh, uh, using verses 21 and 22 and other verses in Paul, for that matter, or Corinthians. How would we answer someone who asked us how we know that we really do have the Holy Spirit? If someone was to ask us that, well, how do you really know that you have the Holy Spirit? Because he stamped us with his eternal pledge. Okay, that's a that's a good answer. Jesus said he was going to send him um, when he couldn't be there anymore. Okay, how do you think Paul would answer that question? Well, he did it in Romans eight. He said that the Spirit witness to your spirit that you're a child of God. Okay, great. It's a personal witness. 
How do you think Paul would have seen in a in empirical, in a physical, evidential way of having the Holy Spirit, having the life of the age to come, being regenerated, being a spiritual person? Let's just boil it down to how would Paul share with empirical evidence that he was an authentic spiritual person? Besides quoting scripture, which is great, but the, the, the uh, atheist or the cynic would say, well, that's a circular argument. Well, Paul says, I mean, in Galatians, he talks about living by the spirit. He says, we don't gratify to the desires of the sinful nature. Um, and then he goes on and he says, you know, if we're Christians, we have the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, uh, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature. And since we live by the spirit, we keep in step with the spirit, you know, so I think that's how Paul answered the Galatians. I, I agree with you 1000%. He would say the evidence is in the fruit. Now, the first thing that we think, or many of us, of us think, and I think, is, well, I don't have, I don't always have a whole lot of love. I don't always have a whole lot of patience. I don't always have a whole lot of whatever. However, he didn't say there in Galatians that you have the fruit of the spirit unlimited and 100% consistently. He did say it would mark a person mm -hmm. as a follower of Christ because they would be doing things that Jesus would do, that they wouldn't be doing otherwise, mm -hmm. right? In my own life, I look at, I find that by looking at other people, other, other friends, family, and other people, and what they do, the decisions they make, how they behave sacrificially and with humility, that is not of the world. Well, where does that come from? Does it come from them? Do they white knuckle it and go to a meeting that says, rah, 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 uh, give, uh, give, giving is better than receiving, and all of that, it was it's not mind over matter. See, what Paul is trying to share with them all through this epistle is that if you want to grow in Christ, you want to look at other Christians as well. And look at me. Look at me and be comforted that in my trials, in my tribulations, God helps me through it. Yes, I stumble. Yes, I make mistakes. But you can see the hallmarks of transcendence in it. And if we think about that, we can see the hallmark, the evidence of transcendence in believers that we don't see in the unbelievers. I'm speaking generally, because obviously there's plenty of unbelievers that make uh, professing Christians look bad. So we all have plenty of examples of those, but I want to zero in on authentic spirituality. And that's what Paul is getting at here with the Corinthians. He's saying, look at, look at my life. Could I do the stuff I'm doing if it weren't for the power of God? No, they know that. And the same is true for all of us. So we can take encouragement in our own commitment, in our own service to the kingdom, by looking around at others in, in Christ. And that, and the second thing that follows up with that, and that's why it's so important to pray for one another. And that's why Paul in the verses that follow is going to tell them, look, we're all the, in this together. And I, you need me, but I need you. He's going to keep saying, I need you. Paul. We, we think of Paul, a lone ranger, you know, he's got the spirit, he goes, goes, does this, that, and the other thing. No, uh, everywhere he goes, he entreats, he beseeches the churches to continue to pray for him because he knows he needs them. It, it's not lip service. We need each other. The body of Christ needs each individual as part of that body of Christ, uh, especially in a lone ranger culture like theirs and ours. I, I'd like at least one feeble amen. 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 Hey, Chris, one, one last thing. You know, what, yeah. uh, I remember Francis Schaeffer years ago saying uh, he wrote a book about, you know, what marks us out as Christians. And he zeroed in on a particular verse in Paul where he says the only thing that counts mm. is faith expressing itself through love. 
the only thing that counts, you know? Yeah. I mean, in a culture like the one we live in or the one that Galatia, uh, the Corinthians lived in, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. I mean, that that really is where it comes down. You know, that's that boils it down to that one word, you know? Right. Uh, you know, and everything... The Everything in the New Testament is predicated on love. I remember Peace too. Everything is predicated on love. I mean, that's what it comes down to. Right. And that gets back to how on earth can anyone have faith working through love without the spirit? Without the spirit, yeah. Right. Because, I mean, he's already, I mean, Paul is like really powerfully driven by that spirit, by the spirit and the fruit that the spirit brings into our lives. All right. Well, let's cl close today with a uh, question. Wait, can I, I have a question quick. W where's the verse that Jonathan said from Galatians? Where well, it it's Galatians 5, verse 6. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And is that, what we, is that what we were doing yesterday, Jonathan? Yeah. I mean, that part, part, part of what we were doing yesterday is trying to okay. express uh, or, or manifest God's love to people out there on the street. Just share. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. in, in just a in, in a tangible way. You know, we we're trying to be uh, loving to people out there and share God's, God's love. Yeah. Because one of the verses I had says, "You are ambassadors of God," and yeah. that. So I, I'm trying to keep track for the records what yeah. we're doing here. So. There you go. All Thanks. right. The final question is going to be passed to John, and this kind of help wrap everything up. Okay. All right. How might we bolster the confident hope of our future eternity with God through our experience of the Holy Spirit now? Oh. Let's think about that. Because what do we tend to do? We look at our future through the prism reduced by how we might feel and measure it by our circumstances or how we might feel mm -hmm. at a given time. So that question's flipping it. How can we bolster using what we have to come that's already guaranteed to help us now. What would be one one way we might be able to do that and help other believers do that? <coughs> the, the word rhymes with ba with bear. <laughs> prayer 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 is a way to grow ourselves and also build up others and uh, be god's presence what else what way could what are some of the ways that we can bolster our own life in the spirit uh in anticipation of the future in other words Living our lives now in the light of that glorious future. How do we how do we make more inroads in that besides prayer? Well, I I feel like my prayer life isn't as effective if I'm not in the word more. Yeah. So I think um reading and meditatively reading scripture um helps me yeah. know the God that I'm serving more. Intimately. Yeah. Wouldn't you also say you yeah, have great, great answers? Wouldn't you also say koinonia or fellowship with believers? No, oh, absolutely. Doesn't matter who. I go to a men's Bible study in my local church here on, on Monday night. I am so blessed by it. Not that these guys are scholars or have to be scholars or anything. What impresses me about them and what lifts me up and really helps build my faith more than would be otherwise is how much how earnest they are and how much they want to grow it i'm i'm mm -hmm. and and their insights their practical insights in the word and i'm just i'm so blessed by it 
And if I was home reading or whatever, yeah, I'd get something out of that, of course. But being with fellow believers, there's something about the dynamic of that that is healing and reconstituting and really strengthening us uh, in a way that when we're uh, alone and in isolation, um, we don't get. Okay. As, a pastor, as a pastor, you know, the, the fellowship that we have and the, the earnestness of the people here and online in this class blesses socks right off of me. So, you know. Yeah, yeah me too. Well, well let's not forget to pray for uh, Connie's daughter, Fawn, has surgery tomorrow. We want to pray. When we go to pray, Fawn, uh, Connie's daughter. Okay. Is having surgery tomorrow? Yeah. And then Doug, let, let's thank God for Doug's healing. Yes. Okay. And, and uh, if I if I can just speak for Doug, I mean, he stood up this morning in, in the joys and concerns and said that, um, well, share about the prayer. Well, Jonathan, when I talked to Jonathan, told him I had COVID, that maybe he should get checked. He says, well, why don't you put it on the prayer chain? I didn't even know we had a prayer chain, so I... I, uh, called, I can't remember Deb and told her to put her on the prayer chain and everybody prayed for me and I think I set a new record in getting over COVID wow <laughs> and I got over it fast great, great. And I had the flu at the same time so I got over that too I had both great excellent stuff yeah the other thing um, I probably got the COVID at the at the gathering, we went to an ECO uh, convention or whatever you National call gathering. it yeah. in Newport Beach. And uh, that's another place where we get together as believers and worship. I, I just couldn't believe the worship there. Yeah. And big St. Andrew's Church had this pipe organ with the pipes all the way across the front of the church. <laughs> it, was just, it was awesome. I love pipe organs. <laughs> yeah. Sounds but great. The worship was incredible, and the fellowship too. The coin, yeah. yeah. Even in a large group like that, getting together with colleagues and yeah. sitting down, having coffee, connecting, reconnecting, and uh, and just praying for each other, finding out what's going on in each other's lives. You know, I mean, you're right. That that's exactly what you're talking about. Amen. 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 So tomorrow. I get an MRI on her ankle. It's been acting up on me for a year or so. Oh, yeah, okay. Figure out <laughs> okay. That's tomorrow. Who said that? That was Gordon. 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 Oh. MRI Gordon. Okay. tomorrow on ankle. Ankle. Yeah. Okay. Back. Thanks, Gordon. Oh, thank you. How do you spell coin in the air? K-O-I-N-E-N-I-A? I don't know. There's no E in it. There's no E in it anywhere? Is this one an I then? Does someone want to pray? Uh, other than uh, let's have Pastor John con conclude in prayer. But if someone would like to pray before that, that would be great. Someone's up for it. I will. I will. I will. Oh, Brownie will. No, Deb, go first. All right. Well, dear Lord, we we thank you for this time together in your Word and for the um, power of prayer, Lord, and mm. we. Thank you for all the examples that you show in scripture of it, Lord. Mm -hmm. And we, we thank you even for your own son uh, showing us uh, by his example the importance of prayer and how to pray, Lord. And, and uh, this time we come before you, we ask, Lord, for your, um, your ever presence with Connie's daughter, Fawn, tomorrow as she has her surgery, Lord. Uh, be with her, be with the surgeons be with yes. the recovery team, Lord, and uh, more importantly, be with her and her family, Lord. Yes. Um, give her your comfort, your strength, Lord, and, and your uh, abundant grace and peace. Yes. Um, Lord, we, we praise you, Lord, for Doug's 
healing and Lord continue to heal mm. him and and Lord we just thank you for the uh, evidence that prayer can can bring power Lord and we ask for Gordon's uh, MRI tomorrow Lord that you be with him during this time be with the um, uh, people that do it Lord and we just pray for your um, your travel mercies as he goes there Lord and for his comfort and that they may um, figure out what's going on with his ankle yes, Lord. And, and get to the bottom of it and, and give him some some comfort Lord and mm -hmm. we, just, we thank you for these things in advance Lord and we mm -hmm. thank you that we can come together as brothers and sisters in Christ Lord and and bring things before you and and Lord I just personally thank you for this study and for the the time that it gets me into the word Lord that's which I, I feel drawn to it. And when I'm in the word, Lord, I am so grateful that I'm spending time with you. And yes. um, Lord, I, I thank you for that, that time with you and, uh, and time with fellow um, believers, Lord, as in the, the koinonia that we spoke yeah. of. Lord, and I just thank you for that. Yes, Lord. Holy Father, continuing our prayer, I would just like to thank you for the times that you set up, that the, the, the situations you create for us to share fellowship with each other to share mm. um your word and 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 your way of life with other people that might not know and just to share your love you mm. just set us up so many times with with opportunities to do that and we're so grateful for that and help us to be more cognizant of times to do that so we don't miss a chance because yes. sometimes we might be too busy or or just not listening so help us to be really mm. open with our hearts and minds for chances mm -hmm. to share yes. and and the fellowship that will ensue when we do yes, that Lord. also quickly thank you for the message this morning with jonathan and um just how he is instilling in us the the foundation that we're going to need when we go out which is kind of what we found out yesterday and how exciting was that mm -hmm. and so we're just mm -hmm. so grateful for jonathan keep him healthy yes. and strong as he goes through the rest of this winter and through the year and just just um just help mm. to continue to bless him and mm. also thank you so much for chris because chris just brings so much to each little morsel that's in the bible that just expands our knowledge so far and just keeps us thirsty for more we are mm. so blessed to have him with us bless him father and his family mm. as we go through this study and mm. i pray that in jesus name mm -hmm. And Lord, uh, continuing, as Bronnie would say, continuing our prayer, uh, we just thank you for your grace again. We thank you that it, it all comes down to grace. We've mm. seen that right here in Second Corinthians, by the grace of God, by the grace of God. Oh, Lord, we thank you for your grace. You're so gracious and uh, you're so loving. And we love you, Lord. We want to express that love to you. Um, Lord, we just come before you humbled by your awesome magnificence and splendor. Yes, Lord. Lord we bow down. Even as, even as John would fall down before the angel, and then the angel said, no, no, not, not, not me, but God. Um, so we, we are just awed by you. We are, we're the ones that uh, come before you humble. Yes. And Lord, we want to, uh, we, we just want to be able to touch other people with the same gospel that Paul is talking about. Yes. The word, the message that that he preaches to the Corinthians, may we be faithful to preach it beyond the doors of this church out into our community. Yes. We just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, everybody. Wow. All right. Well, great class. You. And next, we so we see everybody next Sunday, right? If mm -hmm. not before. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Amen. Thanks, Chris and Stephanie. Thank you, your, Stephanie. All your yeah. work. Thanks. Bye, all right. Buddy. Love you too. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye, Betty. Bye. Bye, Betty. Bye. Bye, Dawn. Bye. Bye Dawn. See you next week. Bye, Connie. Bye, Eve. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye.